I thank you for coming to our exhibit on the flu, but before we get started, two items. My name is Zach, and I'll make a few remarks, but I was being asked if we could all put our masks on for a moment, if you'd be willing to get a photograph taken. <laughs> all right. You want me in the picture? I'm going to have to take this off. <laughs> we get an idea for what it feels like to try to deal with some type of epidemic or pandemic or deal with influenza and try to block us from, from getting sick. So a couple of things, I want to make a few remarks here, and I'd like to give special thanks to those who work tirelessly in putting this exhibit series together. Stacy Knight Davis, Stacy, where are you? If you could think about, you want to step up? <laughs> David Bell, who's back there, he's been managing the music. <laughs> and Andy Kugel, is Andy, Andy here? All right, back there. <laughs> I'd also like to thank everyone in the library for their support and encouragement. A special big thank you to Beth Heldebrandt, who's been working the camera here, for her fantastic work in promoting the exhibit, and to Arlene Brown for all of her behind-the-scenes work. And thanks to Dr. Sheila Simons from the Department of Health Promotions for providing an expert keynote tonight entitled 1918 Influenza, Impact, Implications, and Uncertainty. The library is excited to be a partner in hosting such an important exhibit, the theme of which reminds us all of the immediacy and impact of recent health scares in an overconnected world. It is only appropriate that the library stakes a claim as a central player in hosting the flu exhibit. The library is the fulcrum for interdisciplinary collaboration and is a space that is constantly defining and redefining its democratic responsibilities. The library now more than ever must be adaptable to different purposes and promote the civic and vocational spirit that is in our DNA, in building community and preserving our identity. The library, I often argue, is a space that involves understanding who people are, what they care about, and how to engage them with adventure, play, and struggle to find personal meaning in information. A new democratic space where librarians and library users work together to create real and meaningful conversations about information and how we use it to make our points and live our lives. In this spirit, it is in this spirit and with this understanding that we welcome the flu exhibit so that we might create a space for conversation that it is, is as relevant now as it was in 1918. Now ordinarily I'd say thank you and turn the microphone over to the president for a couple of remarks, but we have a special treat here one is that David, in his hard work, discovered the 1918 yearbook in which there were remarks roasting Mary Booth, who was the director of the library from 1904 to 1945. And what you might not know is that Mary Booth in 1917, and here's a picture of her on the left, in 1917 served in World War I as a librarian. Do I understand that correctly? She handed out books and, and whatnot for the troops. Maybe. Kind of coincided with an exhibit I was at at the MFA in Boston a couple of years ago where the ALA had posters from World War I that said, help our boys, and they had different posters of those going to World War I, going overseas, to bring books for the troops. And then on the right here, she is in the dedication from 1950, when they dedicated the, the new, was it the new library then in 1950? But she retired, of course, as you remember, in 1945, so she came back. And I wanted to read, and I'll do my best to read this, as you can imagine, just briefly before I turn the, the microphone over here, is this written about Mary Booth. It says, on Friday evening, November 9, the numbers of the senior class 18 gave a farewell party for Miss Booth, who had been librarian of our school since 1904. A number of seniors with Helen Dial impersonating Miss Booth dramatized a library science class. Can you imagine? <laughs> science from the library, including the round table, returning and reserving books were shown. Later in the evening, charades furnished much amusement. For both young and old, 
An old time spell spelling match was also held and proved an interesting feature of the evening. At the close, the class sang the following song, composed by one of its members. Mary Booth, Mary J. Booth, we all hate to have you go. Can't you hear Miss Stanley barbing us? Can't you see the drooping EIS? E Eastern Illinois. What was the S on that, David? State, State right. It was got its origins as the normal school. <clears throat> Mary J. Booth, Mary J. Booth, let your spirit lead you through. Go lead us to victory, spelled U.S., as in U.S. to victory. Mary J. Booth, they are calling you. After many healthy handshakes and farewells, Miss Booth found she was one of the most popular persons on the faculty. If only I could aspire to Mary Booth. And it is certain that there are more who do not respect, there are none who do not respect and admire the noble sacrifice which she has made for her country. Let us hope that as we return after years of absence, we will again see Miss Booth sitting behind the desk in the library, a woman who did her duty. So I hope you enjoy the show, and before we get to our keynote, President Glassman, please. I don't think I need the microphone. Uh, thanks, Zach. Appreciate that uh, a great deal. Uh, I have no prepared remarks, uh, nor would they be expected, uh, outside of just a very, very warm welcome for everybody being here today. Uh, I know very little bit about the flu, uh, except that I've had it, <laughs> didn't, didn't like it. <laughs> and when I was talking to Sheila uh, right before I got up here a few minutes ago, we were talking about uh, handshakes and how she said we were one of the few cultures left to do handshakes. Maybe she'll be talking about that tonight. I, I don't know. But it, I reflected immediately on graduation. <laughs> <laughs> I stand there and shake individually at least 1,200 hands during the course of that day. Some dry, <laughs> some wet, <laughs> Some with knobs on them, <laughs> I imagine warts, <laughs> occasional bleeding, <laughs> and I'm going now, what the hell am I doing <laughs> up there when I've got a provost? <laughs> it's December and it's May, you know, uh, I, think, uh, I think I might make a, make a change there. Uh, but in all seriousness, what I do want to say is that the library's exhibitions, I've been here now, this is my fourth year, I have not missed the opening uh, lecture for any one of the exhibitions since I've been here. It has been a highlight uh, to join in these celebrations. And the exhibits are so varied and so wide and so provocative and, and so much allowing for discourse that it transcends any one group. Every single one that I've seen here has brought in students, has brought in faculty and staff, has brought in the public to listen to these great speakers and learn a little bit about history, a little bit about ourselves, a little bit about our future, and even a little bit how Harry Potter was ripped off from, what was it, the 18th century? What? Romantic literature. Romantic literature. <laughs> Who would have thought? Who would have thought? But it's so wonderful, and we're sitting here in the core of the academics of the university. That's what the library is. It always has been. It's the central place in every single university and area of higher learning. And we've got a gorgeous one. And we're blessed to have that. And we're blessed to have the faculty, and the librarians, and the staff uh, that we have here at EIU. And I couldn't be more proud of the work that they do. If you talk about a regional university, and we are one, you do not expect the quality and the type of library that we have at EIU. It's just another little golden nugget in that array of things that distinguish ourselves from being different from all the other regional universities in Illinois and even beyond. So it's my pleasure to be here tonight, my pleasure to welcome you, and I'm going to turn it back over to Jay. Jay's got a couple. Holy, oh, he's got a script. I got. I got to get a writer. Jay, come on up. 
series really is unique and special, uh, and, and it's a tradition, I think, that brings the entire community together, not only uh, our campus community, but also members of the community, and I've seen folks from Sarah Bush, I think, are out there in the audience as well, and so there's a lot of sort of deep and rich relationships uh, that, that sort of are nurtured through this series of, of exhibits, uh, as well as sort of the long-standing tradition of Booth being a, a, a community leader uh, in Charleston and, and Coles County. I've been asked to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Sheila Simon. She's an epidemiologist whose research focuses on the prevention, surveillance, and distribution of infectious diseases. Dr. Simons serves as a certified reporter for Epicor, a notification and dissemination service associated with ProMed. Sheila is a professor in the Department of Health Promotion, where she is the graduate coordinator and teaches principles of epidemiology and epidemiology and public health. Dr. Simons joined the department. Uh, in August 1992. She'll be talking tonight, to us tonight about 1918, influenza, impact, implications, and uncertainty. Uh, and, I, and as sort of a prologue to that, they've asked me to say a few words. You know, over 100 years ago, the Spanish influenza pandemic took a, an estimated 675,000 American lives. 99% of the deaths occurred in people under 65. Nearly, nearly half of those were between the ages of 20 and 40. And it was indeed the most severe pandemic in recent history, with global deaths exceeding 50 million uh, individuals. With little, little understanding of the causation at the time and the risk factors, factors associated with H1N1, public health at that time was woefully unprepared. In total, four influenza pandemics have occurred, 1918, 1957, 1968, and most recently in 2009. Each pandemic has provided lessons for public health, and developments since the 1918 pandemic have consisted of vaccines, antiviral drugs, and the establishment of a global surveillance system by the World Health Organization. Other tools have emerged, such as social distancing. That's, I don't know what that is. We'll probably learn about that. It sounds incredibly awkward. Uh, <laughs> good hygiene, hand hygiene, and cough etiquette to assist in the slowing uh, of the spread of influenza. In the United States, Today, more than 200,000 200, individuals are hospitalized annually with flu-related complications. And over the past three decades, there have been up to 49,000 deaths per year uh, as a result of H1N1. Uh, and with the increase in population, urbanization, megacities, uh, the opportunity in, for the spread of infection increases the likelihood uh, uh, that there will be another uh, influenza pandemic. Despite the many uncertainties in the past pandemics, uh, what we know is that public health has a possible, uh, is, provides us with a pathway for, for planning for and responding uh, to future challenges and risks. It's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, tonight's speaker, Dr. Sheila Simons. I first came in and I see all of you have taken off your mask already. <laughs> uh, put them on for a moment for me, would you please? <laughs> Who's side in or out? Uh, uh, oh. Oh. oh, I gave something. No, maybe. <laughs> well, it depends. Are you feeling well, Dr. Glassman? <clears throat> <laughs> then the blue side is in. <laughs> if, yeah, if you are not feeling well, this, uh, this little blue or color coding, sometimes they're yellow, if you're not feeling well, that color should go in facing you. It's a vapor barrier. Ah, fun fact. This is how you'll remember it. Sometimes when you're feeling good, you like to accessorize with color. <laughs> you got the blue on the outside. You can do it that way. And all of you have it over your, your ears. And I noticed some of you had this look going on. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> it needs to cover the nose. We were just fogging up our glasses. I know. Happened. Yeah, that is. Yeah. And But once you have it over your nose, give it a nice pinch. Nice tight pinch over your nose. And if you don't mind, I'll talk like this for the rest of the time. You can wear them the rest of the time. That's... That's not going to happen. <laughs> that's too. That's that's too hot. So, 
if you feel like uh, feel like accessorizing because you feel well, the colored side goes out. If you're ill, then your colored side should face inward. Again, the blue or the yellow side, sometimes you find them in pink. There's all sorts of colors you wear those, uh, or they are they I'm so excited you guys are here tonight, and I'm uh, super excited that they asked me to come talk about the flu. Uh, Stacy had sent me, a, I think, a, an email, and uh, it was an email, or, and uh, would you like to talk about the flu? And it probably sat in my mailbox for 20 seconds, and I re immediately replied, I don't know, okay. <laughs> but uh, to me, it's... Uh, it serves as a warning uh, of possible things to come when we look at uh, the time frame and the decades in which we have had influenza pandemics. Uh, they are instances in which they're usually somewhere between 10 to 30 years apart. So every 10 to 30 years we usually see something like this. Last year was a, a pretty nasty flu season uh, and usually we start vaccinations for influenza when? When do you get your vaccination? October. October? Yeah. yeah. You know when the students are being vaccinated on campus? October. October 23rd. Yeah, October 23rd. So a little bit later than we like to see, but they'll still provide protection. I always like to uh, offer up a, a couple things uh, right off the top. Um, everybody's heard of the stomach flu? Flu is a respiratory disease. It's not an intestinal disease. <laughs> That's gastroenteritis. You ate something bad or drank too much or it could be from aspirin. Soda, it could be from aspirin. It could be from a lot of different types of things. But when you have the so-called 24-hour flu or you have a slight case of the flu, that is not influenza. If you've had influenza, and how many of you have? I've been fortunate not to. It's awful. Yeah, it is not a pleasant experience. You're, you're thinking 14 days to recover, and that's in today's healthcare system and what is available to you. So it, it is, uh, can take quite the, uh, quite the hit on people. Maybe you've seen this before. Yeah, but uh, Santayana actually said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Uh, I did a presentation in the spring and there was a, a history professor there, Dr. Curry, Dr. Lynn Curry, and uh, she was discussing in a lot of the new textbooks, they don't have the 1918 influenza pandemic in them. That's what I thought. <laughs> That's exactly what I thought. That's how, yeah, so they don't have that uh, in, in some of those new books. So it, it's to us to be able to share that information, to remember that information, uh, and pass along as much accurate information as you can. So first I want to talk to you a little bit about what a pandemic is and what an epidemic is, because each year we have usually some epidemics of influenza. There's three subtypes. We have A, B, and C. Uh, C, not really going to get much of an illness from. A and B are the buggers for us. Um, and we usually consider those epidemics. When it becomes a pandemic, it's global. It's almost on every single continent. So that's where you're going to see the difference here. So when we talk about a pandemic, that has some massive clout behind it. And what needs to be understood is during this time, looking at how easily influenza is spread and troop transfers. It really condemned individuals to illness and death as a result. So, that's on a little bit. So we, here we have the 1918 Spanish influenza, the 1957 Asian flu, the 1968 Hong Kong flu, and the 2009 swine flu, which we also called H1N1. Now, you'll notice that Spanish influenza is an H1N1, as is swine flu, H1N1. So some people think, oh no. <laughs> they are actually different. They are uh, structurally different. Uh, and that was decoded, I believe, in 2002 is when they did that. So uh, Spanish influenza, where did it come from? 
Birds. That's how we saw it in the United States. Yeah, birds. <laughs> Why Spanish flu? This is always my favorite part of it. So they call it the Spanish flu because Spain isn't involved in the war. They're not, <laughs> they don't care if they share their information. It's not going to show if their soldiers or their country is weak and sick. Spanish flu it is. <laughs> I would think some countries would not take too kindly to that, but Spanish flu is what it became. Uh, Asian flu, uh, it did begin in Asia, Hong Kong flu, also there, and swine flu. Somebody said the causation of the animal that was behind that. I think from behind you, who said that it was oh, caused by birds. It was me, because I did the poster, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's where it came from. It came from birds. Uh, incidentally, the hurricane that's happening right now, you can count on those shorebirds being blown off their migratory paths. Uh, last time, there was a fairly large hurricane. We ended up with pelicans in Lake Shelbyville. Blown that far. That had to have been a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Say, the salt water's not what I'm thinking. <laughs> so then in... Um, as we start to go through each one of these, I want to show you a comparison of, of deaths and why these pandemics become so concerning for us. And I'll transfer the numbers into what it would be like today if we had uh, the same pandemic. And again, you'll notice 10 to 30 years. So patient zero, somebody said Kansas. Yeah, that's who we're calling patient zero for the United States. Will we ever find patient zero? We thought we even had patient zero for HIV and AIDS. No, we were wrong. But they've offered him a posthumous apology. But uh, patient zero was a private in Fort Riley, Kansas. And uh, he went in very early in the morning to see uh, a physician. Said he wasn't feeling well, had some aches, kind of feverish. They admitted him. That was around 8. By noon, there were 100 people there. By the end of the week, 500. He served people the day before he fell ill. When you have influenza, you know, you hear people that say, I never get sick. I don't get the shot. I never get sick. Okay. Did you know 10 to 20% of us don't show symptoms? You're a healthy carrier. So you might have it and be giving it to someone else. So if you're around someone who is uh, immunocompromised, maybe HIV, maybe chemotherapy, or other conditions, or their vulnerable uh, health state prevents them from getting vaccines to protect themselves, it's up to us. And what we do when we do that is called herd immunity. I love that term, herd immunity. It's like uh, when I was growing up, I grew up on a farm, and we had cattle, and when it was time to vaccinate them, we'd take them into the shed. Makes it sound like they're bad. We're taking them into the shed. <laughs> Bring your switch. <laughs> so we'd take them into the shed, and we'd get them running in a circle. And they eventually will start running in a circle, and the vet will reach out and give them a vaccine, and then we would mark one. We'd put a little livestock marker on them, and they'd kick it, you would run, and I always got stuck with a livestock marker. <laughs> always, because I had a brother. <laughs> <laughs> so, sometimes we'd miss one. But if we get the majority of the herd, they're protected by all the others that have been vaccinated. That's how we eventually got rid of smallpox. We vaccinated all of the reservoirs, all of the things that could hold on to that illness or that virus. So March 11th, that poor, that poor guy. So we addressed, you know, where it came from. Not Spain, not sure. From a bird, that finally has been determined. The average lifespan between 1917 and 1918 dropped 12 years. 12 years. And really, it was a very minimal understanding. We didn't have the high-power microscopes that we have now. We're looking for something that we don't know what we're looking for. There's no way to detect it's a virus. 
they even ended up creating a vaccine and vaccinated for things that didn't exist. It was the wrong thing. But as you heard, uh, the people who were targeted the most were between the ages of 20 and 40 because they have really good immune systems. And we have great immune systems in individuals that can do great things, and it's all pretty amazing anyhow. But for these individuals, it ended up being uh, the largest complication for them. Here's the life expectancy. For men, we have living to 48 in 20, or 1917. 1918, uh, it dropped to 36. Big dip. And then the same, I'm sorry, gentlemen, 54, we're still hanging out at 42. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> but let's look in comparison, because I hear this a lot. Well, what about these other diseases? What about the plague? How long have we spoke of the plague as being the most epic illness that ever existed? In one year of influenza in the United States, 675,000 people died. In three years, 25 million died from plague. It's such a drop in the bucket. And unfortunately, when you look at epidemiology, what our concentration is on the number of cases and controlling those cases. This for us is obviously very important. In fact, there was a plague outbreak just this last spring in Madagascar, which is not uncommon. And on occasion, we do find it in the Southwest. So again, not uncommon, but we're estimating our global deaths at about 100 million to 500 million. It's absolutely stunning. So let's break it down to pandemics, to the global deaths, and then I'll take it down to uh, the United States. Spanish again, and then two million for Asian, four million. No, it went up. So there's some things that we need to learn from that. And then we see swine flu, globally 575,000 people died, and that was in the 2009 flu season. Normally we do seasons like this coming season or starting in October becomes 2018, 2019, and then they report it all the way over until the next. So that's how those seasons uh, are marked. And there's a way that you can report your own health to help your local epidemiologists, health department, physicians, hospitals, everyone. And I'll show you how you can do that, and it's a simple sign-up. I'm not asking you to donate a kidney. <laughs> <laughs> but I might, yeah. <laughs> have to share one. <laughs> and this is in the United States. So we had global previously, and then in the U.S. We have about 4,000 here. So still, pretty big hunk. Now, the hardest hit city during the 1918 influenza pandemic was Philadelphia. In a very short time, they had well over 3,000 deaths. Almost two weeks, 3,000 deaths. There were 12,000 that occurred over a few weeks, four to five weeks, in Chicago. And you can find those reports. It'll give you each health department report by state. And that's the type of nerdy stuff that I like. But what if we were to project this today? What if the same thing in 1918 happened today? So we're looking at 1.5 million deaths in the United States, 300 million globally, 20 million come from India alone because of their population. There are some great posters out in the front foyer here that you've got to look at for influenza, uh, not just up through the steps, but around like this help desk here. Take a look at those. A lot of them are from this, but we had a lot of challenges. I mean, a lot of challenges when it, uh, and a lot of things we learned. And to me, my, my favorite thing still to this very day to control disease is a good old fashioned quarantine. 
I love me a quarantine. <laughs> I do. I love quarantine. I love hand washing. <laughs> I don't like uh, antibacterial soaps or the hand sanitizers. I usually call them paranoia in a bottle. <laughs> They have their place. They certainly do. But if you're using it to protect yourself just for the flu, the flu is a virus. Hand sanitizer is for bacteria. And there's lots of bacteria stuff out there, don't get me wrong. But uh, hand washing is really going to be your best bet. Anyone have children in here, grandchildren? Yeah, yeah. The best way to teach them how to wash their hands, I love this trick, Dawn dishwashing soap because it takes them so long to rinse it off. <laughs> it takes them so long, they have to put effort into getting that off of their hands. You know, because they'll have soap, and okay, you might not say anything about the soap, but when you put something in your mouth and you get that soap, you're gonna get the rest of it off. I mean, it's going to happen. And it's super effective with them, and they seem to be cool with it, especially when you show them it saves ducks on the front. <laughs> so, um, very limited care because it's wartime. We're sending our physicians and our nurses and other medical staff overseas. Which, by the way, how long does it take them to get overseas? Wow! <laughs> you know, today when you think about, well, then they're traveling uh, 10 knots, uh, it can be up to four months. So you're on a ship for up to four months. <coughs> No social distancing, no actual protection for you, because there's really also not a lot of understanding, except that we told people not to spit and cover your coughs. Um, there's really no way to protect the healthy either. We, uh, I'm sorry, I skipped ahead there. There were times with difficulty in disposing of the dead that cities would call upon and towns, all of their carpenters, to start making caskets. That people were dying that quickly. And they would also have to, in the larger towns uh, or cities, hire people to come in with steam shovels to dig trenches. There is, in Auckland, uh, Australia, there is a very cool memorial that they have for flu victims. And it is right at the base of where one of these trenches was, was dug. They literally stacked bodies, 10 high, and sometimes higher. Philadelphia had an instance in which they had 500 bodies in the morgue, and it was only designed for 36. So, this is uh, among the epic. Uh, our way to protect the healthy, we didn't really know how to protect the healthy. We had people being named health commissioners that didn't know anything about health. So they'd make medicine, but not really know what to put in the medicine. Usually a lot of honey, sometimes kerosene. So you know the good stuff. <laughs> uh, probably some salve involved in that, I'm sure. Uh, so it, we really, again, did not understand. People wore uh, garlic around their neck. And people believe that we were getting our illness from miasmas. Have you heard of miasmas? Yeah, miasmas is uh, sewer gas. And that inhaling it makes you sick. So there's this whole miasma theory of disease that exists. Uh, but people believed that that is something that uh, individuals would inhale, they'd get the illness. We really have a much better understanding of the chain of infection today. And by knowing and experiencing these <coughs> epidemics and pandemics, it has taught us a lot in the, in the realm of response and what we can probably expect from the next epidemic or pandemic. What is difficult to do, though, is they're really hard to predict. People are saying, and somebody just asked me last week, what's this flu season going to be like? I don't know. I have no idea. I can start looking, I have to wait till the cases start coming in. And when the cases start coming in, then I can say, okay, we're seeing this trend. But flu just doesn't happen and then come back around and we're done. Flu occurs in waves. So we'll see, like we did in 1918, three waves. One that started in the spring, one in the fall, 
and then one that was December into January, and that was the third wave. And then it went away. Why did it go away? It just kind of disappeared. The best guess is it ran out of fuel. It doesn't have anyone else to infect. It's, yeah, it's done. <laughs> and it's, it itself has created herd immunity. But let's not get it that way. Like when I hear people say, hey, what do you think about a chicken pox party? Taking a kid and expose, no. <laughs> no. They have a vaccine. <laughs> Quite effective. Bad idea, yeah. So we can't isolate the virus. We have a tremendous number of orphans. We have uh, no real grip on the disease transmission, except we said it's spread by air and through spit. But a lot of our airborne illnesses are also spread by something called fomites, F-O-M-I-T-E-S. Fomites are inanimate surfaces. We touch our faces about 300 times a day. How many objects do you touch in a day? Like how people who were touching their faces aren't anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how many times? About 300 times a day, we will touch our faces. How many doors do you open? Anyone wear contact lenses? Wash your hands before you put in your contact? You're not going to say no now, are you? <laughs> yeah, before you put them in and take them out. Yeah. So, so people get comfortable in a routine, and these routines can put us at risk, and it's just simple, good hygiene practices. That's all it is. And my answer was, and of course there was also, uh, excuse me, the spiritual era of illness in which we believe that you were possessed because you sinned. And uh, there were many ministers at that time that believed that you could pray away the flu. Not uncommon. Not uncommon. Okay. So this is our chain of infection. And this is what is the meat and potatoes for epidemiologists. Because the faster you can break this link, the faster you can end the disease or slow it. We've done it once in 1977 with smallpox. The infectious agent would be the influenza. So the reservoir is where it lives and develops. Us. We're great hosts, unfortunately. And then it leaves our body, the portal of exit, through a cough, a sneeze. I remember walking out of a grocery store in town here one day and somebody's walking out and sneezed in my face. I was horrified. <laughs> and you can imagine for me, I'm still getting over it. <laughs> it was in 92. <laughs> it's really, I mean, it is, it's serious. <sighs> Sorry, you're gonna be. <laughs> so that portal of exit, how it leaves, and then how it's transmitted to the new person. Is it direct? You, know, you inhaled the droplets. Is it indirect? You touch something, touch your face. Is it that? Uh, portal of entry is how it gets in. And then the susceptible host. And for 1918 influenza, it's everyone, but especially. Normally when there's influenza outbreaks or epidemics, what we're seeing is that it's people over the age of 65 and young kids. This was a brand new thing to us, but they were dying from something that was really bizarre to them. And we called it the cytokine storm. We'll do that in just a moment. So the faster that an epidemiologist, or healthcare in general, can determine what the infectious agent is, and then break that link. Once you remove the reservoir, you stop the disease. So, once you get a vaccine, you're the reservoir, you've removed that opportunity. I get a lot of people that say, I get the flu from the vaccine. No, you didn't. <laughs> you didn't know. What probably happened is when you get that vaccine, it takes two weeks for your body to develop some immunity. So in that time frame, it's quite possible, you know, you were exposed to influenza and got it, if it truly is influenza. It could be cold, it could be allergies, there's so many things, it's, it's endless. 
But the first person who uh, gets influenza from the influenza vaccine, I want to meet. And I want them to meet the Pope, and I want them to be canonized. <laughs> I don't know if I'll be able to get that. Okay, so some of the early treatments we had. Snake oils were always uh, the things they used. And there's actually, believe it or not, a recipe for snake oil. Yes, and it's pretty much they stew snakes for an amino acid. And that amino acid is an anti-inflammatory. And some people uh, drink it, and some people apply it directly. The isopentanoic acid is what it is. Can't say that I would want a boa constrictor stew. <laughs> That's not at the top of my list, but I am adventurous in trying new things. Is it better than kerosene? <laughs> <laughs> probably. <laughs> yeah, probably. Oh, it's, it's remarkable. It, and I know a lot of people look at this information and they think, wow, this is, you know, how didn't we get that? Well, we didn't know. I mean, our resources weren't there. We would do something, and, you know, I oftentimes tell my epidemiology class, and this is always my favorite thing, um, how many of you have tasted a pickle or have eaten a pickle in your lifetime? Okay, so then can I not make that leap to say pickles kill you? <laughs> we will. None of you are getting out of this alive unless you have some other plan. So, that's the kind of leaps that people made during that time. Uh, snake oils were there, quarantines, my all time fave. Uh, Closing public establishments. There was no one on streets. They would close libraries. They would close theaters. Uh, police departments were pretty reserved. Uh, they still had to do uh, enforcement. They thought, of course, they were protecting themselves with masks. The mask that they were wearing was the equivalent of gauze. And there is a model that you made that you can see out here again. You got to take a look at that. Uh, and then they did quite a bit of funeral control. And with the funeral control, if you had a family member that died, they would allow only 10 people to attend that funeral. And in 1918, it's not like they're families of three. They're larger families, and they're larger families for working labor purposes, and just statistically something that we see. So lots of funeral control for that. These were the uh, volunteers that they brought in to dig pits. When it got to a point where they exa were exhausted, they would actually bring in other individuals to um, use steam shovels and literally creating trenches. So this is the actual waves of the 1918 until the 1919 uh, influenza. So we see those three waves uh, starting in March and that was in Kansas, uh, and then we see a, uh, a peak, and then it falls, and when it falls, a couple things are happening. One, people are getting comfortable. It's like not as many cases, but it's also you know, building a little bit of herd uh, immunity. But the tough thing about the flu vaccine, even if we're talking about it today, there are a lot of infectious disease vaccines that we get that you don't have to get every year, but the flu vaccine you do. It's smart. It does a drift, it does a shift, it changes its structure, and that's what happens when you have six months to create a vaccine, because that's how long it takes. First, we have to have a group of individuals, like a panel, meet at the World Health Organization, CDC is there, they have their representatives, other infectious disease representatives, I just want to go and hang out and be in the back room. <laughs> promise I won't say anything. <laughs> I can't make that promise. <laughs> uh, and uh, they come up with what they believe to be the three virus strains that they will see. So once they come up with those three, that's what the vaccine is made out of. And that process from the time that they have that discussion until the vaccine is made until we introduce it to the public, six months have gone by. Now, there is a discussion of developing a universal vaccine uh, with the idea that we would have a more of a broad spectrum type of vaccine that can treat a larger uh, 
grouping of influenzas, but also uh, the ultimate goal is to give a vaccine and not give another one the next year. I mean, I think most people who get flu vaccines would be in on that. I, I don't particularly care. It doesn't bother me either way. But I, I'm probably, I'm on board. Okay, so this is, I, I also get a lot of people who think, oh, and I have, you know, a couple of healthcare providers in here tonight. And uh, when I have students that say, oh, I have the flu. So I'm like, don't tell me about it. Well, I got a runny nose and I'm tired. Okay. You go have a sandwich, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're golden. But, you know, with the colds, we're just talking gradual, low-grade fever. You, colds, you know when colds come on because people blame other people for that cold. You gave me your cold. No, you gave you that cold by putting your fingers in your nose. <laughs> That's how that happened. So, we have that gradual, like three to five days, Feel that snow throat, all this stuff. Maybe a little bit of a headache. Mild to moderate. It's usually a pretty productive cough. Maybe got a little hack in it. <laughs> no, I just have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you should have seen everybody's faces. It was great. <laughs> so with influenza, these are the things, the top three things. It's sudden. You feel pretty good in the morning. And then it just progressively gets really bad during the day. You'll have a fever of 100 or more, generally for three days. How many of you are thinking maybe the flu shot's a good idea? Okay. And, and I'll go to hold hands. I have no problem. I take my epi class over. Loss of appetite. The chills, the nausea, the vomiting, you're usually going to feel the worst of everything by the third day. I should say with the nausea and vomiting, that's not true for everyone. Not everyone will get that. But the dry cough is the one thing that people have a lot of chest discomfort with. That's usually the one when you have influenza, and again, the people who have had it, have you seen Old Yeller? Right? If you had, yeah, I know that's a terrible movie reference, but yeah. yeah, yeah. So if you've had influenza and you've seen Old Yeller, you kind of wish you'd be taken behind the shed. That's that's kind of how people feel when they are that sick, and they have no idea of how bad they're going to feel. Now, when they test for influenza, they use a little. There's two quick tests. You know, one can take up to 20 minutes, but it works best in kids statistically. Shows good numbers. So what we do instead is when you seek treatment or you see a physician because you think that you have um, influenza, we'll ask you these questions. And then we'll say you have influenza-like illness. It's faster <coughs> at getting you through a treatment protocol. It's going to be less uncomfortable for you <laughs> because getting that specimen is not a good time. It's like through your nose. <laughs> so, this is how the soldiers died in 1918 and how we still see people dying today. And I remember in 2009, there was a mother in Denver that had a child die and she was standing out front of a hospital giving a, a little press briefing or involved in the press briefing and her question was how is it in today's society someone can die from a lung infection i thought where do i begin you know where where do we begin with that type of information because it what happens when you have inf influenza and if you have had it you should do two things every year. You should get your flu shot, and you should get a pneumonia shot, because it will damage the proteins in it, in the flu virus itself, will damage the lining of the lungs. And again, if you're a healthy carrier, and if somebody else has had the flu or someone else has had pneumonia, it, it can also put them at risk. So it destroys this, the virus itself, that protein, destroys that layer, the epithelium, 
And then they would develop one thing that we still use today as a term, the acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS. Would you like me to stand still? It's not going to happen. to the screen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's keeping me on my toes. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Uh, and what they called it during this time is a result of a hypercytokinemia, or the cytokine storm. Uh, cytokines are a product of white blood cells, a type of your immune system. And what was happening with these soldiers and young people, when we see young people dying from influenza, it is their body's overwhelming response to something it sees as being negative. And it will start to dilate the blood vessels, and it sends in all these white blood cells. And by opening up the blood vessels, it can reach the tiniest of tissue and it sends all of these other good things that are really important as part of the inflammatory response. The inflammatory response is a protective response. We have to have that. I mean, there, and even you know if you've ever broken a bone. Anyone? What, one, two, okay, great, three, okay. Things are looking up. <laughs> Do I have, oh, no. Uh, but if you have inflammation and it's really designed to set that fracture in a way, to support it. Now, I'm not saying that inflammation should not be controlled because there is a line. <laughs> and you have to be very careful with that. It's not setting it permanently. It's just an initial response. And again, it's a protective response to tissue. Okay. So the cytokine storm caused all of this fluid, all of the blood, to build up in the air sacs in the soldiers' lungs, in everyone else's lungs. And their cause of death was ultimately this, but on many of their death certificates, it was drowning. And that, of course, is the little VLI. You can see how this can happen. The smallest of the air sacs, and they're surrounded by a bronchiole that carries oxygen. The fluid starts to build here. It's a really rich network of blood vessels. It carries all the good stuff. And then it starts to fill up the rest of the lungs. People start to cough up blood, uh, sometimes cough up dead lung tissue. So a little more on that. What will happen is uh, necrosis. And some of you know what necrosis is. Necrosis is a lack of oxygen to an organ or tissue that causes death. So you'll have a part of the lung tissue that dies. Uh, the blood vessels will be dilated. Your heart's gonna work harder to get oxygen. It's got its work cut out for it. Uh, but the complications, you know, we have tissue scarring. That part of your lung will not be effective anymore. But also a pneumothorax, which is the collapsed lung. And then infections, secondary infections. Sometimes people will have the flu and they will go to their physician and say, I need an antibiotic. And the physician says, no way, what you need is something entirely different. But there are people who do develop secondary infections and that's what you might need the antibiotic for. So we'll, uh, we'll leave that decision to our healthcare providers to do that. Okay. Of all of the strains, you know, we're just talking like three, three subgroups. Of all the strains, there's 144. Kind of got our work cut out for us, but the good news is not all of them are infective. We really need to have more of an understanding of how severe it can actually be. I think if individuals aren't around people who have flu, even one of my students will tell someone else, oh yeah, I had the flu, and they share the whole story with them. The other person's like, man, that kind of sucks. And that's it. There's nothing more that comes out of that. So I rope them up. I'm going to start tying ropes around their wrist. Like, it's, we'll march over to the union. <laughs> we'll get there. But last year, someone really squeezed my hand and said bad words. <laughs> that I personally have never heard before. <laughs> so uh, understanding the severity, understanding that it's a respiratory disease and not <laughs> A gastrointestinal disease. Um, when you look at the development, again, we're talking six months. Some people are concerned with the safety of the vaccine in itself. Research that has been done on that has been debunked, uh, and uh, in specifically in relationship to the cause of um, 
autism. But we also have some new challenges for us. And this will uh, probably lead into one of the other speakers. And that is the number of migratory bird paths, the number of flights per day in the United States, or actually in the world. <clears throat> and then we also have, you know, avian influenza, yeah, chickens, shorebirds, and then swine. So chicken and swine, or chicken and pork, are our two most consumed meats in the world. That is going to increase by over 73% by 2030. I'm thinking it's a good day to be vegan. <laughs> Maybe. I'm a meatitarian, I understand. <laughs> okay, so let's look at this. This is an H5N1 outbreak in 2005, and these are the flyways of the birds. And this is actually uh, the districts that are in red, they're the ones that actually have uh, the avian influenza. And you'll see right in this blue, is it travels to Alaska, travels to the Pacific America Flyway, comes back up to the Central and Mississippi Flyway, and then back down. How about that? Okay. <laughs> How about this? Right now in the world there are 19.6 billion chickens. And not a single one that you have, Stacy, in your cabinet for display. I know. <laughs> it's not a lie. <laughs> On the other hand, you don't have swine. And that's about 980 million that are out there. So Let's go back. So chickens, this, this area through here, through here. Go back one more and one more, and then look at the flyways. And it's usually shorebirds that cross contaminate. That's how a lot of that stuff happens. You know, how do we get influenza from animals? It jumps the species chain. You're never going outside again, are you? <laughs> Get a flu shot for crying out loud. <laughs> Go out as much as you like. So when we look at daily flight patterns, this is just one snapshot at a time. This is 15,000 flights in the air at once. We have 87,000 in one day globally. What happened last week in New York? Yeah, two planes quarantined. One of them was Vanilla Ice, Ice Baby. Remember? Okay, so the three of us remember Vanilla Ice, all right? <laughs> three and a half at best. Um, but he said, oh, it's everybody's sick on the bottom floor. I'm sure glad I'm on the top. Uh. <laughs> ah! Ah! No, it's not. No, cabin air. That's how it... There are some tricks I can teach you about flying, too, that are beneficial. And you're thinking, mask. You gotta like a little Dracula, right? You gotta like a little Dracula. Self-quarantine is the best. That's what we ask our students to do. That's what we ask all people to do until you're fever free. Fever free? Fever free. For how long? 24 hours. That, you set me up for that. Uh, <laughs> social distancing. In case you have close talkers, I'm a, I don't need to be closer to you than six feet. You don't need to be closer to me than six feet. During flu season, I honestly put a piece of tape down on the floor. I have made people leave my office because they're going into my classroom and they're going to make them sick too. We'll catch up later. Peace out. <laughs> okay. We're good. Also, the cough and sneeze etiquette, that is so important. And that's where uh, the year after the uh, 2009 influenza outbreak, the Dracula cough made it into Webster Dictionary because it was used so much to describe the cough into the crook of your arm. <laughs> made it into Webster's. Um, mask, I already told you how to wear those. 
you know, if you're feeling well, want to accessor accessorize, color out, otherwise, back. Okay. Hand washing, one of my all-time favorites for lots of diseases, <laughs> lots of diseases. Uh, and also the vaccination. And I know I'm kind of harping you here on the vaccination thing, but my guess is most people here are like, So uh, this is what we're vaccinating for this season, and I highlighted a couple of important things here. H1N1, H3N2, and what are they? We're looking at bird and swine. <laughs> and then we have one other one uh, that we usually vaccinate for. It's usually two A's and a B that we vaccinate for. We don't vaccinate for the C strain. It's just not, it generally doesn't make people sick. If it does, it's general you know, feeling unwell, and that's it. All right, so here's your treatment. I hope that if you have had influenza, you were able to get some Tamiflu. The sooner you get it, the earlier you get it, the better. It's an antiviral, it will shorten how long you have the flu, the duration of the flu, but it also will uh, decrease the severity of the symptoms. And there's many physicians that will talk with you over the phone or their nurse will and help you come to that conclusion uh, and then usually talk, speaking with a physician or another provider in the office, uh, they can call it in for you. And then that keeps you out of contaminating their waiting room and everyone else unless you have a mask. Uh, fluids is a big thing people do, starve a fever, feed a fever, what do we do with fevers type of things. You hydrate always. You know, the, the idea of like starving a fever, starving a cold, where that came from I have no idea. But it serves no benefit for individuals to not have nutrition and fluids. Uh, the fever reducer, acetaminophen, Tylenol is really uh, one of the more popular ones. It actually has a cooling effect to it. And then the NSAID, NSAIDs like ibuprofen, uh, which is Advil, naproxen, which is Aleve, and then aspirin. Uh, you just have to be careful if you're going to use aspirin for a child. It is related to a uh, rate of symptom. syndrome. Okay. So this is the pandemic influenza plan. How long have I talked to you? I'm on, I'm on it. <laughs> it's pretty good about that. Uh, so the surveillance epidemiology and laboratory activities, uh, these are the seven domains that we are now using to develop a preparedness plan. This was done in conjunction with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the World Health Organization. Uh, it even, we come down to, you know, medical countermeasures or even the community mitigation. Mitigation is preparedness. You know, when you mitigate for disasters, you're preparing for the disasters. You get your water, you get your food, whether it's peanut butter or whatever. Uh, but you are prepared with that. Uh, the healthcare system preparedness and response, how do you handle so many sick patients? And then uh, public outreach, communications, information, it's very easy. You have to have one person giving information in disasters or it can get ugly quick because they said, they said, I thought I heard them say. So you always have to designate that individual. Uh, the scientific infrastructure and preparedness, uh, that is for uh, the healthcare provider side, and then my all-time favorite, the epidemiologists are in there, but it's also to support the research for the development of vaccines based upon surveillance. And then finally, domestic and international response plans, like what will we do with those? And there are criteria for that. They are posted on the CDC's website, if you feel like reading them. 100, 600 page document or so. Mm -hmm. it, it, great information, really good. I actually have the document. No, I did not print it out in the department. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to cut that to the quick right now. <laughs> Walk that over to Copy Express. <laughs> okay, so this is where you could do me a favor. There is a website called Flu Near You. Flunearyou.org. They collect information from you and then they report it to the CDC. They create maps and these particular maps will provide you with an idea of where sporadic activity is, widespread activity. 
They send you an email once a week, Monday morning. How are you feeling today? Great, thanks. No one ever feels good Monday morning. <laughs> you know, I'm usually okay Monday morning I, because I, I consider it day one of the hostage situation. <laughs> Like, like today is day four, tomorrow is negotiations, <laughs> and, and possibly freedom. <laughs> and then of course we're, negotiations fall through and we're right back to day one of hostage yes. situation. So they just send you a quick little thing, uh, they'll ask you, do you have any of these symptoms, feel great, do this, you report it. It's very helpful, it'll give you local statistics, but it will also give you statistics uh, for the United States. Uh, and then there's also flu view that is through CDC and they'll show you where every single case has been reported to them. When we have a case of influenza or what we call a notifiable disease, it's required by law to report. So it's an infectious disease we have to report. County Health Department, hospitals, physicians' <coughs> offices, um, campuses, they all have to do that. And then we come up with a tally and we can put together a spot map of where our population is at risk. Any questions? Yeah. We talk about uh, even through this one, I was thinking how uh, farming has changed in the past three, four years. What about these giant uh, chicken farms? And that, is, that is one of our biggest problems. And even right now, you can see with the large production of chickens, feedlots for cattle, you know, and where do you find influenza? What animals carry it? Lately we found bats. Bats, dogs, cats. Cattle. Birds. Ferrets. You're never going outside again, are you? <laughs> yeah, so I, the large feedlots, the large production we have, and with the increase of over 73% by 2030, this is going to be a challenge for us, and it's going to require some astuteness. Besides uh, um, getting it through the air, can you get it through the water supply? So I'm thinking that it's going to go into our water tables. No, no, not in, not in a water table. It's, it's an airborne. Yeah, it's airborne. Since the uh, flu virus doesn't really persist in the environment that long, um, what might be some of the implications for the change in global climate? Yeah, that... If we change the migratory bird path, that's yeah. one aspect. Mm -hmm. Storms do it, we do it through industrialization. Yeah, that, that is a whole new challenge to us and how we're going to handle it, especially when we, these storms that are happening now. So uh, if you've looked, they have a large population of, of swine that they have to evacuate. An enormous population, but before they had to do that, they have to pump out all of the sewage pits. So they pump those out into a tank, haul them off, come back, and keep doing it until it's empty. And when you have 500 hogs, that's a lot of poop. <laughs> it's going to take a considerable amount of time to handle that. So we look at the implications of the warmer climates. They have a tendency for a lot of our diseases uh, to really like. Influenza actually likes a colder climate. It likes cold weather. For years we thought when it appeared in hospitals uh, or it appeared in residence, uh, in nursing homes and these other places, we're like, well, it's just because they're all living together inside. It's not summer, they're not living outside. But that wasn't it. It turns out that the virus actually kind of likes the cold. So it will be interesting because there's so many aspects to that that I don't know if we can predict. What recommendations or what does the research show in dealing with uh, anti-vaxxers or those that um, are oftentimes quite educated? Um, typically, yeah, yes, typically very educated. Who do not want to receive a vaccine or give their children vaccines, specifically flu. Oh, I can go so many ways. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's... That has always been my question too, is how do you deal with individuals who are anti-vaccine or they, what we call the anti-vaxxers? And unfortunately with a lot of these things, it has to be something that they individually experience in order to encourage them. Um, 
you know, in the 1900s as health departments, we can march right into the tenements and cities and vaccinate you. Whether you liked it or not, we're coming in because we need to stop typhoid fever or we need to stop diphtheria. But uh, those things are different for us. And I think when people finally understand the value of protection and the millions, millions of lives that have been saved through using vaccines, uh, I'm hoping that that will help change things, but when you don't understand how the vaccine is made, that's really our challenge. Because the, the making of it, you know, people say, well, there's mercury in it. Well, yes, my hand's in mercury, people are gonna die. But in a scientist's trained hand who can make that, they can explain it much better, it's much safer. I'll end up chasing it around on the floor in a ball. That's what's going to happen with me. It's like breaking a thermometer. <laughs> I'll never catch it again. So I, I don't know, Bernie. I just, that has, I was behind someone with a bumper sticker the other day, and it was very hard for me. But they had, they had a bumper sticker that uh, read that no vaccine is safe and learn the truth at, like, antivax.com or something like that. And uh, I read it. And I thought I'm turning here, <laughs> that maybe this is. But uh, I think that we need to engage individuals in a more civil discussion as to why. But when you have a parent that says, no, you're not vaccinating my child, then does it come down to, OK, uh, I need evidence as to why. <clears throat> and we just also had a um, measles outbreak in Texas. You know, the, the immunity doesn't protect us forever, and especially with influenza and how deadly it can be to people. So, I wish I had that answer. Apparently none of us do. <laughs> so, you, you referred to how interconnected the world is now with the number of flights and everything like that. Yeah. I was thinking about uh, a movie you might have seen, Contagion. That's that's a great movie. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. You love that movie? Oh, that's a yeah. Movie. So as as far as epidemiology is concerned, it's excellent. I mean, they take you right back to where it starts. It shows you uh, an anti-vax movement, an anti-treatment movement. So it's it's excellent. If you haven't seen Contagion, I would recommend that. It's a you know kind of a thriller, but uh, it it also has some really practical things. They talk about patient zero. They also talk about another concept that I didn't tonight, but I noticed Ramona mentioned it kind of in a way when you came in. We were talking about the number of people whom if one person had influenza, how many people would have that. That's called r not. It's a predictive model that we use for individuals that get flu or any other disease. So for every one case of measles, we see 12 cases occurring off of that, and then 12 and 12 and 12 and 12. <laughs> Yeah, so that's why the herd immunity thing is really important. So she does address that, and she addresses some other really good stuff. But, I, yeah, I'd recommend seeing it if you have it. Did I answer your question? Okay. Um, so <clears throat> maybe for, like, businesses and their policy for out for their workers, is, is, the, is the movement towards using more video conferencing platform rather than going and traveling to conferencing? Well, it's certainly effective. Yeah, that would certainly be effective to use video conferencing rather than, or Skype, or any other type of modality like that. Um, obviously, sometimes it's not possible. There are some workplaces that actually require vaccinations, vaccinating the uh, population, healthcare facilities, nursing homes, all of those do. Which, you're, again, with sick people, sometimes people even go into hospitals and they might develop a complication and become sick while they're there with something else. Yes, there's sick people there. It's not, it's not avoidable. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the pneumonia shot. Yeah. The conjunction yeah. With the flu shot. Is that for all ages, not just the elderly? You can get it. You can get it. Yeah. Even for a child. I don't know. Do they do children? Do you recommend over six, I think they'll do with. Yeah. Yeah, respiratory existing respiratory. Yeah. And you're looking at you know chronic bronchitis, asthma would be in there. Um, you're also considering people that uh, might have emphysema. So there's there's all those things, but usually 
for an older individual, but there are special circumstances. Mm -hmm. yeah. The new mode, the new Bible 13, that's even at a young age. Prevnar Pre 13. Yeah. Yeah. Very. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing you didn't mention, and I think this applies to herd immunity also, is doing all we can do to keep ourselves healthy. So yeah. our own immune systems work and we don't pass it on. Yeah. And in doing some research on this recently myself, in the last five or ten years, um, I'm aware of about half a dozen or more studies that have shown that um, the lack of vitamin D in our bodies seems mm -hmm. to be related to how uh, the deaths of serious flu. Yeah. And they've done studies to show that those who get a I'm actually a fan of that research. <laughs> Me too. Well, yeah. I've, I've, uh, as I was just saying, the teacher told little bass we should know if we use the vitamin D pill and we can <laughs> just <laughs> so shake it say, out into their hand. Well, when you Swallow. said that um, the cold weather, it may not just be the cold weather, it might be the fact that during that time of the year we produce less, less. vitamin D yeah. and our immune mm -hmm. systems are lower. Mm -hmm. And I think if you look at how flus follow, it's more likely to be in the colder climates and less likely to show up in some of the tropical from some things that I've read. Yeah, we do um, see that, you know, there'll be a lot of cases in Florida or Texas. And follow the flu view maps and you'll see that. And then Alaska will not have very many. Really? But part of that is reporting, is the surveillance. So and you, and when we look you have to look at society. Yeah. In Florida, it's not a good indication. We know all the people from the north that go down there for that's the right. winter. So mm -hmm. that's right. You know, yeah, so there's but, so many. It's like it's one pretty, year. It's pretty convincing. And yeah. when I was just telling that why when I went to the doctor a few years ago and got my vitamin D thing, they said, well, oh, no, 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 don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. you know, it was just a little above 30. And now I realize that's low more, and it should be. Yeah. And, I, and in the studies I was reading about the flu, it should be over 50 to me. You know, being toward the 80 or 90 percent maximum that yeah. for, for maximum. So I was thinking that was another thing we could do. Oh yeah, not only for sure. Eat, not only to eat more healthy, so the whole mm -hmm. system is good, but all, which is really hard. But there's hard. so many ways that we beat down our immunity. Yeah, in, in the winter time. Yeah, too. the vitamin D is is actually an excellent supplement, and I fully support the research behind that. It's one of the few that doctors actually recommend. Yeah, yeah, and there's you know like um, most of the research that's coming out now on fish oil for your heart. Just stop taking it. It's not showing the benefit. And people have been taking it. And thinking, Dang it! <laughs> Dang it! But it may have uh, other benefits. That's right. Not, maybe for, your not for the heart, but it might but have other benefits. And other kinds of things and Absolutely. Like so. Um, and you want to have oil and vitamin D because vitamin D is a fat soluble. Yeah, vitamin, it is so, a fat soluble. So you don't have enough oil. Yeah. yeah. So there's that, and uh, you know, the other day I was. Uh, our office manager is scratching something. I'm like, ma'am, what are you getting after there? And the next thing I know, she has it bleeding. And I said, way to go. Way to ruin your first defense of your immune system. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing at all. Yeah. Sorry. Specifically with 1918. Mm -hmm. um, I'm working on another project right now which involves reading a lot of small town newspapers from that time. Oh, yeah. And what I noticed when I was going through there is other than the notification that this certain person was sick or this certain person had died of the influenza, there was not much else coverage no. about the flu, about what to do, about no, anything else. Nobody knew what to do. Yeah. yeah. Did you uh, look at Jacksonville, Illinois? No, I haven't. Or no, um, Lincoln, Illinois? No, I have not looked at Lincoln. Yeah. Get a hold of their paper if you can from that era, and uh, they had quarantined themselves as a town. Yeah, but, but they didn't I, stop the mail yeah, truck. Yeah, the newspapers I'm looking at are really <laughs> mail truck cup cup are, are really for like rural areas. Yeah, you know, so it's like, all right, in the research then had, is because I read a couple of books on it, and they don't ever talk about the rural areas very much. They talk about yeah. cities, of course. That's and really small dramatic. communities. The rural yeah. communities were just decimated. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. If you have a vaccine <clears throat> and therefore you're less likely to catch the flu, mm -hmm. is it still possible that you could have a lower grade of it and be infectious even though you have the vaccine? I mean, does the vaccine totally wipe it out? Or it just no, no, the so, vaccine so doesn't. You could still carry it, carry it possibly. Carry it. Not for long, but you could. Okay. 
you know, when you look at, uh, so when you're healthy the day before you have influenza, you're already giving it to someone else. And it has shown that you can give it to someone else as many up to seven days. Well, let's say you're exposed to it mm -hmm. three months after you get the vaccine. Mm -hmm. The person who really is sick. Oh, if you're exposed so to you're it. exposed to it again. Yeah. You're not going to get it yourself, but you may still have this. To no. To yeah. You're, you, will be, you will be golden. Okay. Yeah. You're good to go. <clears throat> go wash your hands. Go wash your hands. And cover your cough with that dracula. <laughs> We'll have a chance to ask more questions over refreshments. We were so excited to get food and drink. Now I'm beginning to think this was a good idea. So we have a couple options. You can either keep your mask on and try to eat, or you can head for the bathroom back there and wash your hands, or you can skip it all together. You but can also hold your mask, and it will hold uh, lemonade. And, and you can, if you'd like to use it as a trough, you may do so. We're so grateful for your talk and a small thank you. token of appreciation. We wanted to give you a certificate oh, thank in you recognition so much. of your talk. And I wouldn't shake your hand, but no. maybe a fist bump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.